Welcome back to another Daily Walk. And today we want to talk a little bit about the stronger and the weaker brother. There's a lot that can be said about this topic. I just want to whet your appetite and tell you where you can go to read more. Ultimately, that's going to be Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8 and 9, which talk about liberties in Christ and other factors therein. And so the idea here is that there are things and liberties Christians have that some people may not appreciate as liberties. And when we find circumstances like that, it is the imperative of the stronger believer to consider the weaker believer when you are in their presence. And if you want to do something that you have a liberty to do that a weaker brother would have a problem with, well, you need to do that in your own time or among other believers. Now, there's a difference between that and sin, and we're going to get into that a little bit as well. But for the primary text, we just want to look at one of these circumstances, and this is in Romans 14, verses 1 through 4. Now, accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with a contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand." Now, this section here, of course, is dealing with the dietary restrictions. The Jewish people had certain dietary restrictions. The Gentiles uh, didn't have any dietary restrictions. But what this is probably getting at more likely than anything else is this is in Corinth, which was a big uh, religious center for the Gentiles. And it would be common for the meat sold in the marketplace to have been used to sacrifice to the false gods in the temple. So they'd bring in the meat. They'd sacrifice the, the meat to the false gods. Then, well, you got to get rid of all this meat you're doing for all these sacrifices. So they just sell it on the market. So it's possible that if you go downtown to the market in, in Corinth and buy some meat, likely it has been sacrificed to an idol. A strong believer knows an idol is just wood and stone. It doesn't really matter. I'm not doing this as part of the religious worship. Now, if the, the person went into the temple to participate in the worship and then feasted themselves on the meat, that would be sin. Because now you are accepting the religious principles of the, the pagans in that respect. And that is certainly commanded not to do. But as far as just going out to the market and buying meat. Now, there does say look further on, I think it's actually in the First Corinthians section, if the guy says, hey, this was sacrificed to the, to the gods today at the temple. He says, and there you are, definitely, you probably shouldn't eat that because it's kind of akin to practicing the worship. But what Paul is getting at is a weaker believer coming to Christ in Corinth knows that that meat was probably sacrificed to an idol. And he sits down and says, I can't eat that meat. It was sacrificed to an idol. He doesn't yet understand that he's not participating in the evil worship in this practice. But what he is going to do is he is going to be bothered and upset to his soul about that. And that is what the stronger brother is commanded not to do, not to weaken the weaker believer in that respect. But through enough dialogue and stuff, the weaker believer may come and realize, eh, yeah, okay, uh, I can recognize that. And I have a, a case of that. Of course, I have the book, I Am Not Amused. And if you read the first chapter of that book, it's kind of my odyssey through that era and that arena. And when I first came to Christ and I was first kind of sanctifying my life, you can read about that in um, uh, Josiah's um, um, sanctification. And so... I had, what I started to do is I started listening to this music going, oh, this stuff isn't Christian music. I just need to get rid of it all. And I had talked with one of my Christian mentors about this. I was a very young person at this time. And he says, there's no need to throw away all of the old music that you really enjoy. There's no need to do that just because it's not Christian. Now, now here's where you can have a little bit of give and take in that. There are people who lived in, um, we'll use for the lack of a better word, we'll use the satanic rock and roll cults. We're not talking people who've listened to some heavy metal music, even stuff if you spun it backward, it said Satan wants to kill you or something, who knows. Uh, and I love that type of music and to this day, I enjoy some of that type of music, but I'm not I was never involved in the cult thereof. I wasn't involved in weird sacrificial rituals and things. A person who comes out of that, any aspect of that type of music will draw them back into it. And I can completely understand that's not a weaker believer. That's a believer who understands the depths of sin. 
But a person like me who has not come out of that particular problem, I don't have any problem if it's playing on there. And there might be one or two songs here and there that are particularly graphic or the lyrics are particularly pungent. I might say, eh, I just don't want to listen to that one. But there's nothing wrong with the beat. And that's kind of what Paul is getting at. So there are circumstances by which the weaker believer needs to be catered to. You say, okay, that's, this is, uh, you got to eat this. Now, I also want to bring this up because it's a couple places in there, eats vegetables only. This is not pushing the merits of a vegetarian diet. This is that a weaker believer in Corinth, recognizing that every piece of meat was probably sold, uh, sacrificed to an idol, is like, I don't want anything to do with it. I'm just going to eat vegetables because that's not used in any pagan worship. So that's that had nothing to do with vegetarianism as a higher diet. I know some people try to push that. Now, as we're discussing these principles, there is such a thing as sin, okay? And we have to consider that. And we don't have freedom to engage in sin, but we have freedoms where the scripture does not explicitly forbid us. Now, this is actually kind of the difference between some styles and churches. Some modern churches believe that anything is permissible that is not directly spoken against in scripture, other churches, um, and I know a friend of mine came out of a, a church, a God church. He told me that at least that particular church he was in, they believe the opposite side that you must do church only explicitly what is in the scripture. So there's no music outside of some basic hymnals. There's no Christmas trees allowed because that's got to clearly be of the devil. You can't do anything that is not directly prescribed in the New Testament. And that is an equal part of ridiculous. But when we get to the other side, if you're living your life any way you want, just saying, well, you know, like if you're getting this as close to the borderline of sin, uh, a good example of that is in, in my book, uh, the parody book I did, The Art of Shallow Neighboring. In the original book, The Art of Neighboring, there are very clearly elements in that original book where they are encouraging people to probably sin for the sake of building up your family or your neighborly relationships. Uh, it, it, when you're going in there and saying the police are showing up at your party where there's liquor flowing all over the place, stop saying you're affiliated with a church. You're doing damage to the cause of Christ. Okay, and this is why there's not a solid black or white line. It's not as easy. But our command is in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove that the will of God is that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Our commandment is to transform ourselves by the renewing of our mind. We have to recognize and understand. You see, when we first come to Christ, we are still going to continue living elements of our life in sin. Now, likely God is going to redeem you from one major sin. And you're like, I'm never going back there again. And uh, praise God, many people are delivered out of some serious elements, but a lot of the elements of their life because Christ doesn't make us perfect here on earth. That comes later in glorification. But as we're looking at this, somebody comes to Christ, there will still be sin in your life. And the process of sanctification is the process by which you read and understand and absorb and put into practice the things of scripture so that you become more and more like Christ. As you become more and more like Christ, you let go of more and more sin. It's like unpeeling an onion. You just pull out this layer, then pull out this layer, then pull out this layer, then this layer. This is what we need to do. So how do you know what is sin and what is not? Well, you need to spend your time in the scriptures. One good place is to meditate on this fun list from Galatians chapter 5. No, we're not talking the fruit of the Spirit. We're talking the fruit of the flesh. Verses 19 through 21. The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, and drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, of course, the next list is the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So study that first list and then look at your life from an outsider's perspective and say, is anything I'm doing in alignment with idolatry? 
Is anything I'm doing in alignment with sorcery? Is anything I'm doing in alignment with outbursts of angers or dissensions or envying or drunkenness or caressing? Uh, depending on what your translation is, you might find orgies in there. Uh, there's a number of different things going on inside of that list. And this is really what we are commanded to do. So we have freedoms to eat. What we eat, our music or our entertainment, these are not inherently sinful things. Some things are it can become sin. Some forms of music are sinful. Some forms of movies are sinful. Uh, I don't know of any specific eating that is sinful other than, you know, those absolutely divine cakes you can get somewhere, but, you know, those might be sinful. But outside of that, we have to recognize that there are weaker brothers who have a little bit more, uh, they take a little bit less freedoms in Christ, and there are stronger brothers who take a little bit more freedoms in Christ. As Paul is telling us, don't sit there and fight amongst yourselves over basic things, over must I wear a tie or must I worship on, on Sunday instead of Saturday night because I can get time and a half on Sunday and I still want to worship God and our church has a worship service on Saturday. You know, d wearing ties, wearing jeans, wearing pants with holes in it, going to church. I mean, hey, I'm wearing my holy socks right now. That's just because it's been so rainy. I don't have enough socks. I'm just cycling through until they dry again. I'll deal with it next week when it stops raining. Okay. But <laughs> all that being said, um, we cannot appease everybody, but we must strive to not create stumbling blocks for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that is really where we wanna sit on this. I did mention some references here. Uh, I talked about I Am Not Amused. I talked about The Art of Shallow Neighboring, which is a parody book. I rarely promote that one, but it is actually one of my bigger sellers. You just can't buy the ebook on uh, Amazon anymore. Um, and then uh, there's something about writing a book that's making fun of a book that most of your pastors have talked about and um, nobody else that I've actually talked to has read it, except for like one person. I met one person that read that book. Um, and he understood why I wrote the parody. <laughs> uh, we also talked about um, uh, briefly uh, Josiah's sanctification. All those are available on the website, rwalkinchrist.com slash books. That'll give you a listing of, you can see the introductions to those books. You can see the references of scripture. You can see, you know, just some basic stuff. And then I have links. You can buy them directly from me or you can buy them anywhere you buy books online. With that, thank you for watching and I hope that you enjoy your daily walk in our Lord.